It's my great pleasure to have uh, Lucien uh, here uh, as uh, today's seminar speaker. Uh, he's got uh, his PhD degree uh, from Metal Polytechnic uh, University in France. And uh, he uh, joined here at the University of Brussels. Uh, he's a postdoc now. He is uh, uh, at the uh, University of Arizona. So uh, he's going to talk about uh, inflation. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, so I'm going to talk about this inflation problem paradigm. But more generally, actually, I will uh, talk about the phenomenology of uh, exile in global dark matter, which is a very, very heavy dark matter. And um, this is based on different works. So uh, the inflaton form part is based on the work of this great one, which used to be a PhD student in the University of Arizona in Mount Alpine. So, and then the rest is about the phenomenology of EDV that matter is uh, with people in uh, Europe, Ken Montgomery in Paris, and Matthias Pierre in Spain, Dujin uh, that you know, and uh, other people in Korea. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. So that's, it's, um, that's going to be basically a gathering of different results about exile from blue dark matter from the production me mechanism part to the, to the experimental signatures. And so the talk bit is basically divided into two parts. And the first part will be about this inflaton portal idea, uh, which is a new mechanism for uh, producing dark matter in the early universe. And, um, and the second part will be about the possible detection of experimental signatures. In case, um, in case this dark matter, this dark matter can decay into the, in the neutrino sector. So let me start by some very uh, general comments. First, we don't really know what the dark, se the dark sector is constituted of. We have no idea where dark matter is. We don't know how it is produced in the early universe. We know we have like some guidelines. We have some like very simple ideas, like the thermal field out, freezing, this kind of thing. But basically, we don't know. And in particular, we don't know what is its mass. Uh, you see this dark matter could be extremely light, and it could also be extremely heavy, um, depending on the kind of production mechanism you consider. So of course, if you look at the thermal field out, you mean there are some limits. You can put, you can put too a lot high in the, in the value of the mass. But well, basically, um, we could in, in principle invent a lot of different kind of models. So what about cosmology? Cosmology is not really much better. We don't know. Um, I mean, we know, of course, a couple of things, but it's very, very puzzling as well. Um, we don't know why our universe is so flat. We can measure that it's pretty flat today. We have no idea why it's so, because in principle, curvature is something which should grow exponentially. And we don't know why the CMB is so homogeneous. And this is also very puzzling. It's called the horizon problem. And like the fluctuation of the CMB um, are just all of the minus 4. And that's, that's really, really tiny. And so we don't understand why the CMB is that uh, homogeneous on scales which, uh, you know, original scale, original space time, which in principle have never been in, in causal contact together if you go at conformal time zero. Uh, and okay, and all, we also don't see magnetic monopoles. I mean, you might not care, but that was one of the initial motivation for cosmic inflation. And so, yeah, so that brings me to cosmic inflation. That's uh, an, a, the cosmic inflation is a theory which is a, uh, supposed to address all these problems at once. Uh, so basically the idea is that to dilute flatness, uh, curvature, sorry, and to dilute inhomogeneities of the CMB, uh, the universe might have gone through a phase of very brutal expansion. And um, this um, can be realized in different ways, but the most popular uh, idea is that you might have a scalar field which is just rolling on its potential and the fact that it's over there uh, sources a very large energy in the early universe, and this energy behaves as a friction term, so the this, this scale is actually going down pretty slowly. And then it behaves like dark energy. And um, before going into details, let me mention this number, which is the mass of the inflaton in a very large class of models. So you might say, well, this is not true. The inflaton could have whatever mass you, you want, because there are many different kinds of models that you uh, that you can uh, study about inflation, but I would say that most of the models which only introduce one mass scale in order to address inflation physics would 
usually have this kind of number, so for the mass of details. So it's a pretty heavy guy in principle. So here's more details about it. That's what I said. Like in principle, you have this field of rolling down its potential, and the energy density of the universe behaves as a, as a friction term in the equation of motion. That's why this guy can, as long as this condition is satisfied, this guy can basically slow roll and basically uh, and be there quite, for quite a while. And as long as it's slow rolling, this, uh, the equation of state parameter is close to minus one, and so it behaves basically like a, like a dark energy component in the, in the Earth universe. So this is what you need for expanding, the, I mean, making the universe expand very brutally for a while, such that if you had inhomogeneities, if you had curvature in the early universe, all this gets diluted, and you end up with the universe we know today. And so, but this has to have an uh, to have an end. And so, at some point, what most of the uh, most of the people who do cosmology uh, assume is that the inflaton at some point stops slow rolling, oscillates, and well, at some point it starts decaying efficiently in the universe. And so, <coughs> depending on its lifetime, this reading can happen more or less uh, early. But um, the idea is that once this gets decays. It produces all the standard model particles that we know, and it's not there anymore. Fine. So what about experiment cons experimental constraints about it? Um, well, they are, uh, you, we can read them from the perturbations, uh, perturbation theories, and like which predicts that you might have like, scalar modes or tensor modes um, uh, in the, in the space-time metric. And so you can try to, to measure these things from the CMB, and um, then that, that's how you get these contours, which are uh, uh, published by Planck Collaboration, and now like other, other collaborations that makes it too. And so this, uh, you, you need to be inside this little blob to satisfy experimental like observational constraints. So these, this little uh, circle gets get tinier and tinier, and um, there was there was some excitement a couple of years ago because people thought that maybe this cycle this circle could be like actually not around zero but favor some specific value of the uh, scalar <coughs> uh, scalar perturbations, but um, but uh, actually that's not true. So it's still around zero, and and uh, that means that well, if there are some if there are some uh, some perturbations, they, they might actually the scale might uh, be relatively low. And so this is more and more in, in, um, compatible with models uh, which predict inflate a very flat uh, trajectory for inflation, like uh, so-called Starobinsky inflation or Higgs inflation, these kind of things, which are predicting values pretty much here. Whereas um, simple, like the most intuitive, like naive uh, models of inflation that you could imagine, like the potential of uh, like a quadratic potential for the inflaton, which is the black dot, uh, is nowadays. Uh, Kind of excluded experimentally. So this depends, of course, on the value of the number of evolves that you need for inflation. I will, I will come back to that. Um, so you see that depending on the value of this n star, which is here, you might be at different places for a certain potential, a certain potential so different colors correspond to different potential. And um, and so all the Starobinsky plateau-like inflation, which are very flat trajectory, are not here. That's what I want you to be So now. Um, as I said, the inflaton is supposed, in principle, to, to reheat the universe. So it's supposed to be to have some contact with the particle physics that we know today. So you might imagine a lot of different connections between uh, between the inflation sector and, and the standard model, or we or some uh, sector of PSM physics. Um, I've been working quite a, quite a lot about the, the interplay between inflation and supersymmetry breaking, and, and that's how I kind of started realizing that. If you if you actually introduce new scales in your uh, uh, in, in a sort of particle physics scenario, then then the presence of these new scales can can actually back react on uh, the dynamics of inflation, and that's that's uh, what led me to this uh, to, to give the seminar today somehow. Uh, but you could imagine the interplay between inflation and many different kind of other um, of other particle physics scenarios, which are more or less. Uh, motivated from the UV point of view, and so, um, so it makes sense to actually um, take into account the presence of the inflationary sector in uh, in the, in some lower energies uh, models. But uh, now, what about dark matter? So, uh, 
as I said, the inflaton is supposed to decay. So we, we know that it has to decay at some point into standard model particles because standard model particles are here. We can see them. And we could, in principle, decay into dark matter. And um, when we discuss, when one discusses phenomenology of dark matter production, in principle, uh, you want to consider indirect interaction between dark matter and standard model particles. So why is the presence of the inflaton or the inflationary sector uh, important for dark matter? Well, the first thing you might have in mind is that um, in the case of the thermal freeze-out scenario for dark matter production, you don't really care about what happens at early time because as long as the inflaton is producing standard model particles, we, we as, in this scenario, one assumes that dark matter and standard model particles are in equilibrium. So whoever you produce at early time, um, I would say whatever, as long as you have a sufficient amount of energy um, to, to have this, this equilibrium, then you don't really care about who is produced first. So in the freeze-out scenario, uh, you have a certain interaction between the, the two uh, sectors and then at some point dark matter freezes out and that's how you might get the correct relic abundance of dark matter at the end, depending on the strength of this interaction. So that's the key, that's the key ingredient in the freeze-out scenario, that's this cross-section. Right? And this has to be, I mean, depending on the mass of dark matter, has to take certain values, but most of the time you need to introduce um, additional materials. So you need, new, you need some ingredients to be able to tune and this cross-section to be what you, what you want for the relic density to be the correct one. Of course, this scenario was very popular because of the wind miracle, and you probably all know about that, but um, um, this scenario is more and more uh, constrained experimentally, but was having the advantage of predicting the correct relic abundance for an electric scale uh, mass of dark matter and interaction. But this, and this scenario is, uh, has this very important unitarity, which tells you that the mass of dark matter can be heavier than uh, 100 TV, roughly. Now, there, there are other classes of scenarios, uh, other classes of scenarios, uh, which, in, uh, among which the, the non-thermal scenarios or freezing mechanism, uh, which are also very popular. And in this one, the inflaton is assumed to reheat the standard model only. And, and then the standard model might produce out of equilibrium some dark matter slowly. And uh, if you're lucky enough, then you have enough uh, dark matter at the end to explain the correct free abundance. But there is one strong assumption, which is that um, you don't have any production of dark matter at early time. Because if you do introduce some decay of the inflaton into dark matter, then you have some initial relic abundance, and this thing will kind of grow in the, uh, along the uh, history of the universe, and then you have to take it into account in the production mechanism. Um, so again, you need, uh, as a key ingredient, the cross-section here, and it needs to be well, quite, quite uh, small as compared to the freedom scenario. But as I said, you have this strong hypothesis here. And I want to uh, emphasize that there, is the, there was actually a paper by a number of collaborators <coughs> relatively recently in which they um, actually showed that the, the, the fact that you assume that the inflaton is producing standard model particles and, you and that you assume that standard model particles do couple to dark matter, um, actually you can't really ignore this decay because at the loop level you might actually be producing some dark matter from the decay of the inflaton. So in the, in the IR freezing scenarios, that's not really a problem, but in the case of UV, like very UV freezing scenarios where, where actually most of the production happens very close to the radiating time, this is actually very important. It can be, can be absolutely not negligible. So here you can feel, start feeling that being a little bit specific about what happens during the reheating might actually has, uh, have some important uh, consequences in the discussion of dark matter production. Now let me introduce you another scenario of dark matter production which um, was proposed by a group of collaborators and that uh, Marco Chilean covered is called homeopathic dark matter because it's kind of trying to dilute um, pro problems that you might have about, um, about unitarity in principle in, in particular. So in this scenario, you assume that the inflaton is decaying into standard, standard model particles on one side and some dark particles on the other side and that there is no equilibrium between the two. And in this case, um, you have two thermal baths with two different temperatures. You have a hidden temperature, which is different than the visible temperature. And um, what's kind of cool here is that dark matter in this case can freeze out within the dark sector and you, um, in the dark sector then you have a really density of dark matter 
and a lot of some something else, let's say a dark scale, for instance, uh, which then at some point cools down, becomes non-relativistic, can dominate the energy density of the universe. And then, as long as you assume that this guy might be decaying correctly linked to standard model particles, then um, you might have a big entropy dilution effect. This is a very, quite well known effect in cosmology. And, um, and then, uh, this, this entropy dilution will actually well, will dilute the relative density of dark matter. So, what, ha what happens is that you can have a, a relatively heavy dark matter candidate decoupling in the dark sector. And you don't need to push its cross section too much. You don't need to keep the unitarity bound because uh, you will have this dilution at the end. So you can have a heavy dark matter candidates freezing out. So it's still a thermal scenario, but you're helped by this dilution at the end. So you can have dark matter which is heavier than the PEV and have the correct radiant abundance. But of course, you, I mean, one can have one can uh, give some criticism to that because. There are two magic ingredients in the story. The first one is that um, you have a hidden temperature, which is different than the visible temperature. So how do you choose your initial conditions? Because you can take them to be the same, same or you can just take a ratio. Uh, who, who knows? So this is a free parameter of the model. And then there is a, something which is not a very nice aspect of it, which is that you assume from the, from the very beginning that, uh, that the two sectors are not in equilibrium. So you, you kind of decide to separate them from each other. And then at the end, you say, ah, but magically I have this late decay of this dark scaling into standard model, and that helps me tuning my predicate balance. So it's, it's, in the end, it's quite a lot of ingredients for uh, doing something which is not very spectacular, which is just addressing the correct predicate balance, just that you are allowed to have a uh, heavier dark matter candidate. So it's, in terms of a proof of principle, it's good because you can have like a thermal scenario with a more than a PEV dark matter. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say there is a lot of tuning in this. Okay, now what about the inflaton bottle? So this was an idea I had a couple of years ago. I was wondering whether you could um, imagine that the dark sector and the standard model sector, which in principle can both be assumed to be coupling to the inflaton, could actually uh, have interactions mediated only by the inflationary sector. So of course, uh, your first reaction must be that if you have an inflaton of 10 to the 30 GV in there, uh, as a mediator, this is far too heavy for having uh, to, to make a, a feather scenario work. So you can't imagine a thermal scenario dark matter there. Um, but in principle, I mean, I should there, and these people have, have, have also studied this question before. Um, you can imagine some non-thermal scenarios between these between these two best from the inflaton. Uh, but in the most naive, at least in the most naive uh, scenarios, so not without adding too many ingredients. Um, the problem in there is that you still need a sufficient cross-section somehow, so you need to push a little bit the couplings uh, of, the, I mean, of the inflaton to these guys to be able to have enough dark matter in the universe. And the problem is that when you do that, you're forced to push this coupling, and then you're, you're actually forced to produce dark matter from the decay of the inflaton directly, rather than from the freezing mechanism. So in the end, it's not so nice because you try to do freezing, and you realize that in the, for, for the freezing to work, you actually need the freezing to be something. Well, but also you don't have to keep this scale to a thirty. That's your job. Yeah, that's I agree. I agree. I can make it hundred GB and hundred degrees cold If you do that, most of the time you would need to introduce a new mass scale. You need to introduce the idea that the mass of the inflaton in the vacuum is very different than the energy scale of inflation. If you take Higgs inflation, for instance, you can do that. You can have the quadric couplings gives you the energy scale during inflation plus non minimal couplings. No, inflation point inflation. Sorry? Inflection point inflation. You don't need that. Inflection point inflation. Oh, inflection point. Okay. There you don't yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, inflation can be 100 GB as supersymmetry rating. Right. So you don't need but, but because the mass of the inflaton in the vacuum is completely dependent on what happens to inflation rate. No, connected to the no? sub supersymmetry rating. Ah, okay. so, yeah. Because supersymmetry is broken during the inflation. Right, 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 right. And inflation, the scale determines a dark That's true, that's true. Well, we should. We can, we can do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this class as well. But yeah. if you take like natural inflation, even alpha attractors, like oh, uh, counting inflation, all these models all have this feature. Right? That's why I'm focusing on this, thing, but you're right. <coughs> um, okay. So, Assuming that kind of mass, you can 
you're not so happy both with phrasing and phrase out scenarios. Now, what about this other scenario um, I told you about with this model from Hooper, where you have the dark sector on one side, the sun on the sector on the other side? Well, I told you that you need a very late decay of this guy into standard model to happen. And what if actually this decay is going through the inflationary sector? The fact that you have this very heavy mass scale might motivate the fact that this guy is long lived and might come to dominate the energy density of the universe and decay and do this entropy deletion mechanism. So I will have this little toy model in which the main assumption is that uh, both sector, sectors, the dark sector and the visible sector, don't interact together but through the inflaton here. So I have a dark scalar, a dark fermion interacting together so that you have thermal equilibrium on the dark sector side. And, um, and then the inflaton couples both to standard model fermions, whatever it is, something which is in thermal equilibrium with uh, the, the standard model, and, um, and the dark and the, and the dark other candidates. Okay. Then you see that the, this scalar uh, can decay through an inflaton propagator into some other particle. And this mass is very large, so it will suppress the lifetime of this guy. But the nice thing in there is that if you think about it, um, you have a few free parameters which are all involved in different kind of things, but um, which are not, uh, which you cannot disentangle from each other. Like for instance, these couplings, GH, GV, so the coupling of the inflaton to the hidden sector to the visible sector, basically tell you, um, so tell you first what will be the reheating temperature taken. Uh, taking them together, and uh, also what will be the branching fraction of the inflaton into uh, dark matter or the inflaton into standard model particles. So what I was telling you earlier about the fact that this hidden temperature versus visible temperature uh, in this uh, model from Hooper was actually taken as an arbitrary parameter here, it's not an arbitrary parameter. It's, it's given by the ratio of these, of these couplings. So this is, as long as you fix these, these couplings, you know, what, you know what this ratio of temperature is. But these couplings are also involved in this uh, very long uh, lifetime of this dark scalar. So the branching, um, the branching fraction of the inflaton into dark sector or visible sector is also um, somehow giving you some information about how long-lived uh, the scalar is. And then you have this coupling here which, tell, which tells you um, when the freeze out happens in the dark sector, which is also involved in this, uh, in this um, late decay of the scalar. So if you, well, you do the computation, you do figure out what the relative density of dark matter is, and um, for now I take numbers which correspond to uh, roughly to to the benchmark parameters that Hoover was having in his paper, and uh, you see that for these numbers and for the rating temperature which is larger than 10 uh, MeV, not to screw up the BBN predictions and uh, values of the coupling which are of order 1, you can have a relative density of order 0.1. So if you just look at this formula, you, you might just laugh at me and say, well, you have far too many numbers to claim anything because you can always adjust this different thing to make it work. That is true. But actually, this, as I said, this preheating temperature here is also given by some parameters which are involved in the computation of this thing. So the, the reheating temperature itself has a certain formula which depends on the different parameters involved, and you see the power, I mean, there are different powers in there. And, um, and it's actually not so easy to accommodate the correct relic abundance, taking into account the fact that you should not have a too low reheating temperature. So here are some numerical results. So you see here, this is in the plane of mass of dark matter versus uh, coupling in the dark sector. So I have scalar and, and pseudo scalar coupling, which I think is equal, but whatever. And, um, and, then, um, and then for different ratios of the visible versus hidden couplings, you have these lines which correspond to the relic uh, abundance with different colors corresponding, corresponding to different choices. And this dash line corresponds to the BBN bound, T rating smaller than uh, 10 MeV. 10 MeV. Here is just like uh, perturbativity. And so you see that um, you don't have, so you should be in between these and these basically, so you should be there. So for a given choice of parameters, um, you're not free uh, of choosing whatever dark matter mass you want. Uh, you can you can play around a little bit with the numbers, but you basically have a little bit of uh, uh, you're a little bit predicting what the mass of that can be. Well, but there is still some freedom. There are still you can still 
maybe along the sum choice of the parameters. Here is the, in the same plane for the same choice of the parameters, uh, that tells you what the reading temperature is. So it could be like basically up to one, uh, one GV or a little bit more. And this is just to say that this is still okay for doing things like low scale epigenesis, uh, uh, for instance, which you might uh, want. Okay, now, so, so that's one thing. So you can play around a little bit with parameters, you can get the correct running abundance, fine. What about experimental signatures? Well, um, as I show you here, it's, we are talking about a very heavy Doppler candidate because it's like 10 to the 7, so this, this is 10, uh, 10 PE. You see that here, if you try to play with these parameters and uh, you actually realize that this little triangle between perturbability and um, BBN bound gets smaller and smaller. So you actually have kind of a lower bound of the dark matter mass. So it has to be heavy, it has to be of a PEB scale at least. Uh, and it has very few interaction with the final model because it goes through the infratil portal. So you, you can't hope to have any direct detection constraint uh, about this model. So you could hope to maybe uh, have a significant annihilation into scalars because these scalars are relatively short lived, right? at least today. So if they would be produced in the galaxy, they, they might lead to visible signal. But annihilation of very heavy tabular candidates is actually very hard to see. Um, so, uh, because, because the number density is very small. If the diameter decays, that's another story, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the second part of the talk, and this is model dependent. So for now, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to keep focusing on the, on the diameter of the diameter. <coughs> well, now, um, what about inflation? We're going to discuss about the diameter protection, and for now, I've been fixing this, uh, the mass of this inflaton to 10 to the 30 GV, but in principle, you could take whatever uh, potential for the inflaton and just compute what's its mass in the vacuum, right? So just take the secondary value in the vacuum and see what it gives you. So this is not a real three parameters if you specify what the inflation scenario should be. So in this paper, we, just, we chose to, to consider the alpha attractor, uh, the alpha attractor model, which is uh, kind of cool because you can go from a chaotic uh, inflation scenario to a star robinsky like inflation scenario by just playing with the parameter, the parameter alpha. Um, just to see what it gives you. So if you start being explicit about what is inflation, which makes sense because you, you're using the inflation, the inflation sector to, uh, to discuss the production of dark matter. So an important point is that if you start being explicit about how the inflaton couples to dark matter and, visible sec and the visible sector, there is actually a, a back reaction um, to, um, uh, from the loop correction on the inflation, uh, the inflation trajectory and this might have the effect of destabilizing the, the inflaton, uh, well, the, the inflaton potential at large field values. And large field values are usually something you need, I mean, at least in large classes of model, um, that you need in order to do, to, 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 to do inflation for, uh, for a sufficiently long time, because you need a certain amount of defaults of the inflation. And this, the fact that you flatten the trajectory, if you have like a family loops that's typically flattening, uh, might modify the predictions for these uh, observables that are the tensor to scalar ratio and spectral index. Also, maybe the Gaussian in the introduction can change the Gaussian because these are all interactions you were having. So the I mean, if you have more fields yeah, right. oscillating, yeah. yes. The Gaussian meter would be. That's right, that's right. Yeah. We need a look at that, but you need to look at so if you look at the chaotic inflation scenario and you and you ask uh, what's the effect of that on the tensor on the, in the plane, the plane tensor to scalar ratio and spectral index, uh, well you see that these stars are the, just the, the chaotic inflation without any flattening effect at all. You see that basically that has the effect of bringing you back down a little bit depending on the values of these uh, couplings and. Well, looking, looking at this plot, you can say, ah, oh, that's fine because like n equals 60, maybe I can just rescue chaotic inflation by just flattening the trajectory a little bit using this metric effect. And maybe if I have the right, correct value of these parameters, then I might be like here, a little bit borderline, but still inside the contours, right? That would be very optimistic. But um, this is actually not so simple because the number of equals is actually not something that you're completely free, free to play with. And we'll come back to that. And, um, but okay, here at least you see that the value of these parameters 
um, should actually be small because if you go to like more than 10 to the minus uh, 10 to the minus 3, you're basically completely run away at very low spectral index values, and, and that's not good. So you don't you don't want uh, too strong coupling of um, of the inflaton to to matter fields because that destroys the prediction of inflation. So if you take actually small values of these couplings, coming back to the plots I was showing you earlier, you see that you're actually going towards very heavy value of the mass of black matter, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 uh, GV. So you go closer to the exact electron scale than the PE. Now, uh, as I mentioned, you're not free to choose whatever number of defaults you want. Um, in this model, basically, we have specified everything from the inflation time to, um, to present day in terms of uh, cosmology. So we know, you can know in principle, given a certain uh, model, what exactly happens. You know how, you, you know that you can have certain evils of inflation. You can then, uh, we know that there is this slight dark component which becomes non-relativistic and comes to dominate the, the energy density of the universe at some point. So we have a period of early matter domination. And all this together, uh, in principle, modifies the number of defaults that you need for inflation. Because once you can specify everything, like for like how your universe is expanding with, um, along the way, uh, you know exactly how to compute uh, the number of the number of defaults of inflation that you need. So it's not usually people say between 50 and 60 because you assume like you assume like a thermal scenario of dark matter and you don't really know when the riveting was happening. So that gives you some uncertainty if you don't want to be model dependent. But if you want, if you if you build the model. Um, describing the whole universe evolution from inflation to today, then you know exactly what happens, and you know the number of people that you need. And this is crucial. And uh, if you play this game in this model, and try to see what you actually need for chaotic inflation, you, need, you see that actually you need less than 50 defaults. So coming back to the plot I was showing you earlier, here, less than 50 defaults is completely ruled out experimental. So chaotic inflation doesn't work. So, so how do you understand what's limiting the uh, number of imports for chaotic inflation? So uh, this is just the additional interaction to the dark matter. So that's what changed the flat bed to something. Um, so physically, how do you fix it? Because chaotic inflation, I can go take the infl inflation forever. But now you are limited to just 50 folds or less. So you must right. So the, this is due to the this is due to the presence of the well this number of less than fifty full I suspect is not just for chaotic inflation. I say other inflation scenarios will also have this feature, but it's just that we we have an early meta domination period in this in this story, and that's needed for the entropy dilution uh, effect to take place. So. The fact that you have this long early metal domination epoch reduces the, num the number of efaults that you need for inflation. This, way, this is not. This is but not that's not true when massive yeah. matter domination can be Because uh, I can see for chaotic or any other inflation, mm -hmm. it can run for infinite number of efaults. Because you don't have any control. Because the no, 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 no. But I'm talking control. about the number of efaults. I mean, because you're measuring this tensile scalar ratio and, and spectral index at a certain time, right. at the right. time of right. horizon crossing, right? So the right. number of people, why do you say infinity? Infin so I can have the inflation going for infinity, but then we just right. use the last 60 folds or 50 to 60 exactly. folds. Yeah, you're right. you're right. But you're what right. you are saying, inflation cannot go all the way to that many folds in the whole inflationary period. Right, okay. okay, okay, okay. So my statement is too strong, that's what you're saying. But this is not, you can you can have more efforts of inflation, but that's that would not be the point where you would right. measure this, right. the tensile scalar ratio right. in this particular right. case, right? Yeah. That's your point. Right. So like how, if, if that's your point, like if inflation only can last for people, then I want to know. No, 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 no. That's not my point. That's not my point. It's just that when you, when you draw this, when you, when you look at this, Constraint. This is computed at horizon crossing, oh, nice. and so, and so the number of efforts that you're using here is not saying that you need only 60 efforts. When you say 50, 60, it's just the time where you I actually uh, measure. Oh, so, yeah. So in the case of chaotic inflation, the fact that you have less, that you need to have less than 50 efforts since horizon crossing, is is the is actually running out this scenario. So 
What about Starowinski inflation? So we went to Starowinski inflation, and we've got uh, some rating horizons. Um, so all the color plots, the, rain the rainbow uh, colors here, are points which satisfy the correct relation values. So playing with the values of uh, GH for the fixed ratio, GB versus GH, and the fixed ratio of the masses in the dark sector. And that, and that is, in, again, in the dark matter mass versus dark coupling um, space. And you have different kind of constraints. So you have this big, big boundary case synthesis um, constraint, which is similar before, just importing that the rating temperature is not less than 10 mm. And you have this no inflation region, which is the, the region where the, if, if the couplings are too strong, then the, then the inflation trajectory is destroyed before you can actually do it tough. Um, and perturbativity, and you also actually also have the unitarity bond, which is here. So that would mean that basically this triangle here is allowed for, for these uh, fixed uh, ratios. But on top of that, each of these points um, somehow correspond to one specific trajectory uh, of the inflationary trajectory. So you can compute what are the observables and compare them to the brown contours. And you see that all these brown regions here are excluded by brown. So you should be in this little thin region here. So you can see that this, these are constraints which come from very different perspectives. So it's just like we have put together certain, certain sectors, and, you're, and we're saying that the dynamics of inflation, the reheating of the universe, giving you the Vivian bound, the, well, the inflation observables, and, um, and unitarity in the dark sector basically makes your model very, very predictive in this sense. If you play around with these ratios, you see that, uh, so if you increase, for instance, the ratio dark matter mass versus dark scalar, you see that this uh, region becomes a little bit more tiny. Um, and if you play with this ratio, saying I want uh, the, the copies to be the same, you see that it shrinks as well. So, um, so you're not so free. And, and in the end, you see that the region uh, in which you are, like 10 to, between 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 11 GB for dark matter, is, uh, remains remain actually the same. And so if you play the game and go to like large values of this ratio, you see that you're almost completely excluded. So we end up being very predictive by putting all these constraints together for at least for a given model. Uh, so that's the conclusion of my first part. Um, so, uh, well, we propose an inflaton coil to scenario to, to, to produce dark matter in the universe. And well, I guess I've come through all these conclusions already. Uh, of course, this model has the problem of being, I mean, as it is, if you don't in, uh, add more ingredients, it has the problem of not being very, very well, uh, not, not very easy to detect in terms of like really detecting dark matter. But you see that different constraints from, from cosmology and from the observational, observational constraints about inflation itself actually constrain the dark matter scenario more than you would expect. Gallic inflation is ruled out in this scenario, and uh, of course, and you can try to look at other inflation scenarios. Okay, so if you don't have more questions about this part here, I will uh, switch to the second part, but if you have, maybe if you have So, well, did you think of our spectrum at the uh, large angular scales for your signal? Because since Starwitz is more of working, I think you are, uh, you'll be limited to the given info. So, they have, uh, because there is a power loss. Right. right. But then you think the power spectrum for your signal, like, is there a power loss at our team? No, we don't check that. Just look at the spectrum. I think you should take the box. I think you can see the box. Okay, okay. I don't know much about that. Okay, so there is no more question. I will uh, switch to the second part, which is trying to find signatures of exactly from the scale of dark matter, and in particular in the neutrino sector. So. This is a separate, I mean, I don't want you to think that this part concerns the previous model. It's some, in some sense, because in the previous model, uh, in the infantile model uh, setup that I showed you, I was not, I didn't introduce any decay term for dark matter. But in principle, I, could, I mean, one could. Um, so I, I, I just take this first part as a, let's say, say proof, of, proof of principle that you can generate EEV scale dark matter candidates in the, in the universe in weird uh, thermal scenarios. You want, but at least there is a way to do it. And um, now I just want to ask the question: If there is a dark matter candidate of the exotic triple scale in the universe, 
And if it decays in the nutrient sector, can you actually see some effect? And um, you will see why I talk about the, the nutrient sector. So uh, first, if there is an exotic trombone dark matter candidate in the universe, uh, detecting it is very challenging. And um, as I said earlier, like looking for annihilation of it is extremely hard. Um, and even if it decays, actually the problem is that at such energies, the decay products of such a dark matter particle might not propagate long enough to be actually detected on Earth. So we, we know, for instance, that primary, I mean, photons for sure don't, don't propagate at these energies, but uh, you know, pro uh, primary proton cosmic rays actually are expected to, to scatter the CMB, uh, this is the G uh, GZK uh, mechanism, and so limits on it. Um, so we expect that these guys, uh, these guys have a hard time propagating for, for the galaxy when they're produced. And so, well, the number of the number, the number of density of particles is so extremely low that that's what I said about annihilation. So now, if if this dark matter particle decays, uh, what can you what could you see? Well, there is a collaboration called the Anita collaboration, which has been looking for actually such high energy, ultra high energy cosmic rays since a few years, and I'm gonna. I uh, told you about it a little bit. So the idea, the idea of this ANITA experiment um, was to detect the product, the scattering product of, I mean, the, the product of very high energetic neutrinos entering the ice and producing an electromagnetic shower coming from the so-called Ascarium emission in the ice uh, at the South Pole. So this balloon is basically flying over the South Pole and watching down the ice and using the volume of the South Pole ice sheet uh, as a detector. So um, even though it doesn't have a very long uh, exposure time, it was using a very large volume to try to see something. So, but these uh, rays are usually assumed, I mean, this, this emission is, is in the little code over there, but we expect such high energetic neutrino to just propagate a little bit through the ice because when they are so energetic, Neutrinos can propagate within, like, through the Earth very freely. Uh, we know that like uh, low energy neutrinos can totally, but at, at such energies, um, a neutrino can propagate on more than 100 kilometers. So you don't expect it to cross a very large portion of the uh, of the Earth or the ice. You expect it to come at very low angles. So this uh, balloon has been flying for a couple of flights. Um, and in particular, these uh, three ones have uh, been uh, uh, fully fully running and, and reporting uh, some results. This fourth one has been running more than a year ago now, and they didn't uh, publish their results yet. So let's see what they actually uh, say. But there was a very interesting thing, which was that during uh, two of these flights, uh, the first flight and the third flight have been each of them detecting one event that, which was actually coming uh, from very deep down the earth and they were interpreting it as something upward going and they claim they can make the difference between something which is downward going and reflecting on the ice and upward going looking at the polarization of, uh, of, the, of the electric field measured, measured there and um, this, this, they claim that they saw two events coming from very deep down the earth and that they could not Correlated to any astrophysical signal, um, so that was uh, that's what they call, uh, call their anomalous events. So as I said, um, neutrinos. So standard neutrinos. We know. I mean, we, we think we know how they interact with matter. So if, if they arrive very down, very deep down the Earth, and they and they scatter along the Earth, we know where where approximately they should scatter, and they might give you or not some some shower in the atmosphere. So the interpretation the ANITA uh, collaboration was making of these anomalous events is that probably some neutrinos could be able to propagate um, deep enough through the Earth and produce a tau lepton, which could then decay into a hadronic shower in the atmosphere, producing a very, uh, very energetic uh, electromagnetic shower close to the balloon, basically. And these events were detected at 27 and 35 degrees of emergence angle, so this uh, theta emergence here at energies of order one exotic volt. And as I said, at such emergence angle, a standard neutrino cannot cross the Earth. It's very, very improbable. So there was a large uh, literature on the topic. There were people um, trying to interpret these events as uh, pure standard model, but actually downward going, claiming that 
the analysis that Anita has done is not correct and that they, they might actually have seen something which was reflected on the ice rather than something going through the earth. There were some BSL interpretation claiming that it was actually not more going and that somehow whatever happened such that something done while doing was interpreted in the upward going thing. And then, uh, well, you have like a different kind of interpretation, BSM, upward going, and then dark matter uh, interpretation of it. So I'm going to focus on two, um, two scenarios, uh, which, which are not very uh, far from each other, but uh, one, this paper with Mogherini and collaborator, this paper with Tuji. Um, and I'm going to go uh, through this dark matter interpretation of it. So the feature of these events, as I said, are that there are at energies of a few exotic I mean, a fraction of anxiety from both actually, like the wrong one, and uh, zenith angles, or the different, I mean, they are, can play with here, of 100, 125. And the mean interaction, so these people are, have, have basically looked at this in detail and tried to see whether a pure standard neutrino could actually be the origin of these uh, signals. And they said that the mean interaction for a neutrino at one exotic from both along this uh, core length, so that you have the, at, at the an angle, we know how long was the core length, so like 5,000 kilometers, 7,000 kilometers, and the, the, mean, the mean interaction length for the neutrinos is like 200 kilometers, so we are pretty sure that these uh, neutrinos, standard model neutrinos can have gone through. The interesting thing that these people noticed is that um, they, were, they were wondering whether Ice cube might actually have seen such events as well, because if you have like very energetic neutrinos able to actually go through the Earth, then Ice cube might have seen something as well. Um, <coughs> and they claimed uh, that the Ice cube collaboration, so actually Ice cube has a hard time uh, reconstructing some very very high energetic, energetic events because because only a fraction of the energy actually contained inside the detector, and so apparently there was one event. I think this one that IS, the ISP collaboration, uh, explicit, where the ISP collaboration explicitly, explicitly said that um, the, the thing that they saw uh, and that they have interpreted as being got downward going might, have, act, might actually have misinterpreted and could be potentially something going upward. And so these guys uh, actually took ISP data and reanalyzed their data, trying to look a little bit more if they could be more like upward going events. And, well, I, think I couldn't tell you more about this because I'm not sure exactly what they did. But they claim that um, there are two other events, which uh, of like 10 PV, uh, which could also be interpreted as upward going. So that would be like three events here versus two events here. And so I want to question whether it's possible that these two signals are actually come of the same origin, maybe from a dark matter origin. You see that the energies here are significantly lower, like one or two orders of magnitude lower than these energies. So is it possible that the origin is the same? So, well, given a certain BSM uh, scenario, you can uh, imagine that maybe the propagation of a neutrino through the Earth gets modified by the presence of new states, which could propagate a little bit more through the Earth. Um, you might also imagine that the particle arriving uh, on Earth is actually not a neutrino, it could be a highly, a highly energetic uh, particle, whatever it is. <coughs> and then you can, uh, well, use this, I mean, the, the density curve of the, I mean, the density profile of the Earth and just try to compute exactly what happens when, when something crosses the Earth, given a certain, certain cross section, and given a certain angle to compute an effective area of the detector. And uh, this effective area is a combination of the exit probability of a, sort of a certain incoming particle, so this particle arrives, like transforming into something within the Earth, and produces something which is able to produce a harmonic shower in, uh, in the atmosphere, then there is the probability of decay in the atmosphere, and there is the probability of detecting this shower uh, by the, by the experimental device. So in this first paper, we imagine the possibility that dark matter is decaying into right-handed neutrinos, and that uh, this right-handed neutrinos might, might penetrate the Earth much more, and then convert into a left-handed neutrino, and then this, the usual thing would happen. The neutrino would convert into tau, and this tau would decay in the atmosphere. So we have uh, reused some uh, Monte Carlo simulations used by the Anita collaboration to um, simulate what, uh, how, the, how the transparency of the Earth gets affected by the presence of, I mean, by, by the presence of this uh, mixing angle theta. So depending, the more, the more, the, the less the neutrino is able to mix with the left the neutrino, the more the Earth becomes transparent, basically. So before the standard uh, neutrino is 
very big at very low emergence angles, but for a smaller missing angle, you can actually go at lower angles, at larger angles, sorry. And uh, then we try to simulate what Anita could see, what, I, what Ice Cube could see based on, uh, uh, I mean, based on the simulation and different, different features of the two detectors. And what you can see is that actually the effective area of the two detectors is, uh, is significantly different and that somehow um, Ice Cube would, uh, would favor the detection of events at larger emergence angles, whereas Anita uh, would favor detection at relatively lower angles. But you see that the effective areas uh, would be uh, of this, I mean, very close to each other somehow. Uh, the effective area would be very close to each other. And then given the exposure time, you see that the number of events that you could ex expect is, uh, is also of the same, roughly of the same order. And um, so that gave us a little, um, like, a, like a rough analytic estimation of how many events Anita should have seen and s should have seen for a given mixing angle, a given lifetime of dark matter, given exposure time, and a uh, given mass of dark matter. And you see that you can get similar number of events, uh, interestingly. Now, okay, you, one can say uh, one thing which is not so nice about this scenario is that you see that the peak that you expect for the for the detection with Anita is actually not at very large angles. It's at like like at most 10 degrees, which is not a very nice feature of this scenario. Um, okay, but the interesting thing that you can that you can see, I mean, once you simulate exactly what happens through, uh, while these things go through the Earth, so that you can track uh, because you can track who is losing energy on the way. And, and what are the events that are actually detected by S cube or by Anita and at which angle? So you can kind of uh, dissociate like um, what are the different energies of uh, the, the of the neutrinos which are detected by S cube or by Anita, and what are what is the distribution with respect to the to the emergence angles? So on the on the side of Anita, so which are uh, events which are of energies higher than um, 0.5 uh, exile electron volts, you see that. These two heavens have been detected in regions where um, the number of heavens that you expect is anita, so the, the, the full height, depending on the energy, is always a little higher than the, than the number of heavens that you want that you should detect with ice cube. Whereas on the contrary, for lower energy energetic heavens, uh, you actually see that the ice cube, where the angles where the ice cube heavens have been detected, maybe. Um, is in a region where ice cube, the dashed lines, are always above um, the, the lines predicted by Anita. So I would say this model is not very convincing in the sense that uh, we are not explaining correctly uh, why Anita has been, events, have been, have been seeing events at uh, large emergence angles, but what we can clearly see is that uh, it, is, it is kind of natural within the scenario that ice cube is, det is detecting at least given the angles at which they detected something, it is natural that they, that they detected something at lower energies. Whereas Anita is more able to see larger uh, energies. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, how can you get actually a better angular distribution? Because this is not very satisfying. So the problem with this model was that um, if you assume that the signal that you have seen comes from the decay of the tau, you know that this tau can have propagated through the Earth significantly. So you know that you need to produce it right uh, under the ice, basically. That uh, means that you have a relatively small volume that you can actually use. So you can basically use the, the little uh, layer of ice at the, at the south pole to actually, uh, to actually produce something which is visible by Anita. Uh, <coughs> which means that um, if you have a small volume that you can use for detection, if you want to explain the signal, then you need to push the scattering cross-section to be large enough to actually produce enough events. But if you do push the cross-section, then the Earth becomes relatively opaque at a large angle. So that's the problem. So you want so so if, if the Earth is opaque, that means you favor low angles. You don't favor large angles. So what we understood with the gene is that um, if your Earth is actually transparent, then um, uh, so if, if the Earth is not transparent, if you have a particle A scattering into a particle B and this particle B is able to decay into, into hadrons, then uh, if the Earth is, trans is, is opaque to the propagation of A, that's what I said, in favor um, a propaga uh, 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 sorry, an interaction of A very early when propagating through the Earth. Whereas uh, 
if this cross section is actually relatively small, then the, the scattering probability becomes relatively uh, I mean, uh, uniform along the propagation. And then if it is uniform, and if your particle B is actually relatively long, long lived, so if it's not a tau, if it's something else which can decay into, into quarks, then you basically can use a large volume inside the Earth to actually uh, be able to produce a shower in the atmosphere. So um, you can sketch the exit probability of an entering particle A, which should scatter given particle B, which should decay. Um, and you look at the probability that a particle B ex escape the Earth when, once a particle A enters, that looks roughly like this. This is the minimum between uh, the, um, sorry, the length of the core and the, um, the decay length of the particle B. So that goes like this, that goes up, and then that's really, that's really the close. Uh, that's really the constant after that, because you can basically escape whenever you want in this volume. So if you believe this, and then you combine it with the detection probability of the detector, which goes right here like this, depending on the decay length of the, of the particle B, then you see that you can actually get different kind of profiles for the, the effective area of the detector. And then you just like ask, OK, what, 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 is, the, what is the perfect, the best fit value? And that would be when the, the maximum is at 40 degrees. And this is something you can get if you have a long-lived particle B. OK, but that's now that's kind of very theoretical, I mean, theoretical in the sense that this is not a particle physics model so much. We have not addressed um, anything about that kind of uh, specifically. So we looked at the uh, model of inelastic boosted dark matter, and which is, is an expert on this kind of model, um, in which you have a super heavy dark matter candidate which decays into a lighter dark matter candidate. So this guy is super boosted, it's very energetic and uh, arrives in the Earth. And if this guy can upscatter into, um, into another particle K2, and this particle K2 can either um, produce K1 and quarks with an off-shell dark photon, or produce this dark photon and then this dark photon decays into quarks, um, then in principle that, that provides you another way to have a hadronic shower in the atmosphere. So the idea is to escape the idea that the tau uh, is actually producing this shower. And if you do that, uh, you basically can have a particle which is relatively uh, for, for which the Earth is relatively transparent, so this K1 can propagate relatively long inside the Earth, and this K2 can be relatively long-lived as well. And so then uh, we um, chose some, some benchmark for parameters and could show that actually, depending on the um, kinetic mixing in the, the dark photon and the, and the smaller photon, then you can um, basically reproduce uh, the number of events that um, for Anita, that you would expect for Anita to be uh, actually having the maximum around the angle where you saw something. And uh, you, can have, you can still do that with a lifetime of dark matter which is uh, much larger than the edge of the universe, and with a dark matter candidate which is uh, at a high, at a, at a large uh, energy, at a large mass, uh, which corresponds to the energy that of, of what Anita has. And have the correct number of events for the, for the Life, uh, the, the, sorry, the time of anything. Yeah, so that's basically much it. So the presence of dark matter in the a very heavy dark matter uh, in the galaxy, which would decay into neutrino, is something which should be accessible to uh, to um, neutrino detectors on Earth. And um, the very important thing is that the BS, the presence of a BSM sector might significantly modify the way something can work and you know, propagate through the Earth. And so the knowledge of, I mean, given a certain Scenario: You can track what are the typical energies of the particles that uh, you expect to see in, the tech, in different detectors, and that might be very interesting complementarity constraint uh, between uh, ice cube and anita. And well, I hope I convinced you that maybe the dark matter mass of at the exact thermal scale could uh, actually be something which could see to, which we could see today uh, in experiments. Thank you very much. Questions for Lucia? So let's see. 